Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lunes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lucke. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you for the words of introduction, which um, I would like to compliment a bit, so I will follow up to what you just uh, uh, said, Mr. Uh, Professor Lucke, on the um, on economic and monetary union. Um, you are absolutely right, and this is one of the reasons why I left the, the ECB. It what was not only my criticism to the operations of the European Central Bank, but uh, also the change in the design of economic and monetary union. Uh, I have been involved uh, in this project uh, of economic and monetary union since um, June 1988. So from the very beginning, so to say, from the um, European Council in Hanover in June 1988, when the Delors Group was uh, founded um, to work on the design of a European Central Bank or of EMU and uh, to work on the design of a, of a statute of the ECB. But in May 2010, let me say in a coup d'etat, this design was totally changed. We have experienced a regime shift, a paradigm shift in uh, May 2010 and the today's economic and monetary union has nothing to do at all with the original design. And uh, the main features Professor Lucke referred to, namely the no bailout clause. The no bailout clause is not um, valid at, uh, uh, at present. It had, has been replaced by a bailout clause, by a bailout um, in creating first a temporary facility, the EFSF, which was transformed into a permanent economic, sorry, in a permanent European uh, stability mechanism. The second main feature, important feature of a monetary union, namely the um, prohibition of monetary financing has been violated as well. And this started already in May 2010 with the purchases of government, Greek government bonds by the ECB, followed by the purchases of uh, Irish government bonds and Portuguese government bonds. And then in 2011, in August 2011, the uh, SMP, though this, the uh, Securities Market uh, Purchase Program, the SMP, the first uh, purchase program of government bonds, was extended to Italy and Spain. And this was based on conditionality. This was based on conditions which were imposed by the ECB on the Italian and on the, Greek, uh, on the, on the Spanish government. You know, it's, it's well known, it's, it's public that there were letters were written to the um, prime ministers of Italy and uh, Spain, uh, and in these letters it was clearly said what kind of reforms were expected as a basis or as a condition for interventions in the, in the government bond markets, which followed after that famous weekend in, uh, on, on, on Monday, um, the 9th or 10th um, uh, of August 2011. And this was the day when I personally, internally, announced my resignation. What is also key is that the Maastricht Treaty itself has not been changed on economic and monetary issues. It was bypassed by intergovernmental arrangements, by intergovernmental agreements. So we have now the paradox that we have in parallel the treaty on the one hand and intergovernmental agreements on the other hand. And this is really very difficult to explain non-Europeans, but also to Europeans, and in particular to my um, uh, fellow country, countrymen. Now what I'm going to discuss um, with you today and uh, this is the reason why I have been invited uh, to, uh, to join this, work, this workshop today, are the consequences of um, the unconventional measures taken by, by the European Central Bank, uh, uh, and in particular since uh, 2014, with quantitative easing and um, with um, uh, negative interest rate uh, policy. I will structure my remarks uh, as um, follows. I will focus on five points. First, on the so-called new economic thinking, which is not that new, as you will see. I will discuss briefly the innovations and experiments by central banks, not only by the, by the ECB, but also by other central banks. Uh, I will discuss um, whether these measures uh, are justified and uh, whether they are really effective 
uh, are they effective in um, yeah, pushing inflation up? Uh, are they effective in um, um, pushing growth up and uh, help to, uh, to, to create jobs? And what are the consequences, um, the unintended consequences, um, as uh, they are discussed um, uh, in particular in some, uh, in some fora? And then what about the exit? How to get out of this situation? Uh, how to exit? Um, uh, is this feasible? Is it possible? Are there any ideas um, um, from the, on the side of the ECB? Uh, and this also in the context of the summing up. Now the new economic thinking. Thinking outside the box. Since 2008, 2009, we, uh, the central banks operate in a different environment. But the crisis which started in 2008 and 2009 mutated in Europe into a sovereign debt crisis, uh, into an institutional crisis. So we have multifaceted <coughs> crisis in, uh, in Europe. It's not only uh, still the debt crisis which, is not, uh, which has not been resolved, which is still there, which can escalate um, any day uh, and nothing is resolved. So, but um, monetary policy, thinking outside the box, um, um, we are in uncharted waters. Uh, with all these new measures which have been created. Uh, so there are new tools in the toolbox uh, of uh, central banks, uh, in particular quantitative easing and the negative interest rate policy. Until, let's say, until 2008, 2009, there was the idea there is a, a lower bound, a zero lower bound in nominal interest rates. You cannot go below zero, right so. And now for the first time in history, this has been tested. Not by the ECB, it started in other countries, in other European countries, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Switzerland. Then the ECB followed, uh, and, um, all followed up and also the Bank of Japan. But um, b the reason why Denmark, Sweden and Switzerland embarked in this uncharted, or moved into this uncharted territory with negative deposit rates was just a reaction on the expansionary, ultra-loose monetary policy of the ECB in order to defend the exchange rate against the euro. So this was the only reason. There was not the reason to bring inflation up or to, uh, to boost, uh, to, to boost um, the GDP growth. It was just to defend the exchange rate, to prevent a further appreciation of the respective currency. And um, what I say here with the, the, the largest monetary experiment of all peace times, um, fortunately, more and more economists see this as a, a huge experiment, a huge experiment with an open outcome. And I, in my view, most central bankers are not fully aware of um, the consequences, um, the negative consequences of uh, these policies. Now, let me remind us of the role of interest in society. This um, goes back in the first semester in uh, economics, um, but um, sorry to do so, but I think uh, to have, uh, we must have a basis for the discussion. The interest rate is the price of time preference. It is the instrument to coordinate savings and investment uh, decisions um, and very imp in this context, a very important role the interest rate has is the steering and signaling function uh, for the allocation of resources. It's shaping the capital stock, the production structure, and the interest rate is reflected in all other prices. This is the traditional understanding of the role of interest rate in a market economy. But today we have a different approach. Um, and. Um, when I say when I said this, um, the new economic thinking, it's new economic thinking for the continent, for the European continent. The mainstream outside the continent has already uh, ever been so based on Keynesian on the Keynesian approach. It's an other policy instrument for short-run aggregate demand management. And in arguing this way, I would like to demonstrate, would like to to um, to show you that the ECB has fundamentally changed its strategy. It started its strategy in 1998, 1999 with two pillars, the economic analysis and the monetary analysis. And then the okay. 
could we comment a bit louder or is uh, <laughs> yeah? okay thank you um, the ECB has changed its uh, monetary policy strategy and it's to, is today um, so it was very proud the ECB was very proud to have its have its own monetary policy strategy not following suit the inflation targeters around the world but to have a, a strategy was really well designed tailored for the euro area region and this has changed silently formally they are when if you look when you look to the introductory statements there is still this um, structure monetary uh, economic pillar economic analysis monetary analysis the cross check and so on and the, the, the conclusions uh, forget about it it doesn't matter anymore it, it, it has no no reason it, it does not reason anymore so um, they, the ECB has changed its strategy and is now uh, like other major central banks around the world an inflation targeter now what about negative interest rates a very important question is how can an interest rate be negative it means I make this very a very blunt statement here it means that um, the lender gets back less than is lended seemingly violating uh, the economic truism that there is a positive time value of money and negative interest rates and this is uh, I will come back to this this is the core or the heart of quantitative easing to force market participants mar financial market participants and economic agents to take more risk I will show this in more detail later on so financial institutions and economic agents are forced to take more risks and to make investment or loans they would not make otherwise. Um, in a discussion I had recently with a, uh, a life, life insurer, he said, okay, we really, we are forced to do something. Uh, and we cannot invest in um, government bonds anymore uh, or corporate bonds, the uh, corporate bond market. All these markets are distorted by the ECB's interventions. There is no room anymore for us. So we are forced to, inter to, 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 to buy securities, um, to buy paper, to, inter to invest uh, in, in markets um, um, of which the risk we cannot really, uh, really assess. So more risk. Or it means um, to impose a tax on banks' uh, earnings. And this again has repercussions on the ability and the, on the ability and the willingness of banks to provide credit. Now turning to the ECB. The ECB has um, become the main crisis manager in the euro area in 2010. Without the ECB, I'm absolutely sure the euro area would uh, be in a different shape today. So in this respect, the ECB was helpful and was successful to keep the euro area in the as far as the composition of countries in the euro area is concerned, to keep the euro area together. And it's in its self-understanding self or self-assessment, the ECB is the only well-functioning federal institution in Europe. There is a grain of truth in it. Uh, but what does it mean? It means um, the ECB has taken positions, has become a political player, filling a political vacuum because other European institutions like the Council or national governments were unable to react and to do the right things. So in order to prevent uh, the euro area falling apart, the ECB intervened. Why did she intervene? Did it intervene? Because it was flexible, could uh, take uh, decisions very quickly and what is most important for financial markets the ECB has unlimited financial resources. When this was signaled to the markets, the OMT, whatever it takes, in July 2012, we had immediately a positive market reaction, market, markets calmed down. So this was positive. But what does it mean? Is this still all this what the ECB has done and is still doing within its mandate? A very narrow mandate? which says the primary objective of monetary policy is price stability. 
And if price stability is achieved, the ECB will support the economic policies in the, in the, uh, in the euro area. But here it clearly, clearly, it's, it's clearly stated that the ECB has gone beyond its mandate, operating as a political player, and uh, has become the most powerful institution in Europe. And there the question comes up whether this is still based on democratic control, because going beyond the mandate, what does it mean for, democratic, for, the, for the democratic legitimacy? And in particular, the, lender, the role as a lender of last resort for governments. So in other words, um, monetary financing of governments, monetary financing of, um, of official budgets, this is quasi-fiscal policy. And this is, in my view, outside the, outside the mandate. So I am total disagreement with the European Court of Justice. I'm totally total disagreement with the um, German Federal Constitution Court. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an, I'm an economist. Um, so I judge the measures taken by the ECB from an economics point of view and not from a legal point of view. And by the way, um, the rules and principles uh, and European law has been twisted quite some, cause it's quite some, since quite some time. Uh, to make, uh, not to, to, to create new problems. Now, what are the innovations uh, and, the, and the experiments? With these uh, acronyms, um, I think um, you can forget, uh, but um, we have to work, one has to work with these acronyms. Um, the um, Extended Asset Purchase Program, uh, consistent of um, Asset Backed Securities Purchase Program, covered bonds, private sector, so, sorry, public sector purchase programs and corporate sector purchase programs. These are the instruments in the context of quantitative, quantitative, quantitative easing and summarized under the EAPP, the Extended Asset Purchase Program. What, is, what are the targets? There are multiple targets and initially the ECB mixed up targets with instruments. Also, the exchange rate was mentioned. At the same time, Mr. Draghi, the president of the ECB, said we don't have an um, exchange rate target. But the objective was, the target was, to first to talk the euro down, the euro exchange rate down, followed by instruments which brought the euro exchange rate down vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. The targets are to fight the deflation. Okay, we can discuss uh, whether there was ever, has ever been a, a deflationary threat. In my view, no, but I come back to this. To anchor inflation expectations, to foster nominal GDP growth. Um, I would like to stress nominal, what does it mean? Via higher inflation. Repair the, the bank lending channel and promote credit expansion and to weak the euro exchange rate. What is, on what is the quantitative easing based? Um, as I said, um, the um, traditional approach, the traditional theory was um, uh, the zero lower bounds or the nominal interest rate of zero cannot be preached. There, is, there are no negative nominal interest rates. And the ex post theory developed in particular on the other side of the Atlantic by Ben Bernanke and others, uh, they argue when approaching the zero lower bound in order to make monetary policy still effective to make a contribution to higher inflation, to make a contribution to higher GDP growth, means to keep short-term interest rates um, low for longer than expected by market participants, means to change the balance sheet of central banks to change relative supply of securities, and this means a portfolio reallocation and a reallocation of port in the portfolios in the sense uh, or in the favor of more risky investment. And they expand the central bank's balance sheet to keep short-term rates uh, at, uh, at zero. These are the three main elements of this new theoretical concept, which was developed ex post. Because Bernanke said quantitative easing doesn't work in theory, but it works in practice. So a new theory has to be developed. And there is a new theory there. OK, we will see. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important chart. And this part here is the heart of quantitative easing. This is taken from a uh, publication from the IMF staff, uh, uh, the impact channels of quantitative easing. So how does QE work? First, what are the objectives? 
First, to raise inflation expectations. Second, to lower interest rates. Third, to rebalance portfolios. As I just said, uh, to take more risks and to the reallocation of, uh, in the portfolios. And this works on, this has an impact on firms and households, and firms and, or the companies and households are also influenced by high capital markets and by the banking system. In capital markets, um, what has to be, what should be achieved by quantitative easing are higher asset prices. Higher asset prices uh, means, okay, there is a wealth effect. This wealth effect will translate into, yeah, higher private consumption, resulting in higher GDP growth. This has worked with QE1 in the United States, less so with QE2 and not at all with QE3. In continental Europe, we have a total different situation, totally different. We ha don't have this wealth effect. Capital markets are not as developed as they are in the United States. So one cannot rely on the wealth effect uh, in this respect. And why has the ECB in 2008 or 2009 not embarked in quantitative easing at the time when the, when the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England launched this program, their, their, their respective programs? Because of this fact, we argued it will not have no impact. So what the ECB has, uh, did at that point in time, at the, when the um, crisis escalated, the Western uh, financial crisis escalated, we identified other non-conventional measures uh, which created a similar effect as quantitative easing um, did in, in, under other circumstances in the United States and the United Kingdom. So it was, but it was not perceived as, um, as the, the ECB doing the right things at that point in time. In my view, this was correct what the ECB does, that did in 2008, 2009, to lower rates and um, to provide uh, additional liquidity, liquidity for a simple reason that the interbank market had dried up. Banks didn't trust each other anymore. In order to avoid the collapse of the banking system, more liquidity had to be put into the, into the financial system. This was a logic. Uh, I still subscribe today, but was not what was not understood by other central banks uh, outside the continental Europe was what uh, was not was not understood by economists uh, in uh, in other regions was that we had we produced a similar effect, uh, bringing the overnight rate down close to zero, uh, as it was the case also in other in other countries. Now, what is here? As I said, this is the heart of quantitative easing. Here, the green part, greater economic risk-taking. And this, the, it is green because there are the effects by taking more economic risks uh, are assumed to be positive. With greater investment, with stronger consumption, with higher growth, but not potential, I must say, uh, not potential. Uh, this is uh, very, very strange that, they, that the IMF um, argues that there will be higher potential uh, and higher inflation. But here, the red part, greater financial risk taking, and you see this is really red, stretched asset valuations, so um, overvaluation of, um, of, uh, of assets, rising credit and liquidity risks, life insurers under pressure, currency volatility, and greater flows to the emerging markets. And exactly this is what we have seen. But the focus of those central banks which have launched QE, including the ECB since 2014, look in particular to this part, to the green part, uh, and less so to this part. But this is a very interesting and very important chart to understand how, is, how QE is intended and um, um, designed to work. More risk, but where is the control of risk? Now you see here that the ECB, and this is just for, just for illustration um, where we are, the so-called uh, interest rate corridor between the uh, marginal lending facility um, and the deposit facility uh, has, was always um, um, two percentage point, and this has been narrowed down. We have now a deposit rate of minus 0 0.4. We have a main refinancing operations rate of zero, and the, the marginal lending facility rate is um, uh, 0 
Um, what has happened with the uh, with the purchases um, uh, with government bonds, corporate bonds, and so on? Since the launch of quantitative easing, the ECB has purchased securities of about 1.5 trillion euros. In the public sector purchases program, 1.25 billion euros. And you know that in December last year, the ECB Governing Council decided to extend the program until the end of this year. Uh, so in the first quarter 2017, 240 billion uh, euros will be added. And in the remainder of, the, of, the, of 2017, the last three quarters, additional 240 uh, billion will be added. So uh, we will come up, we will come very close to 2 trillion euros on top of what is already on the, on the uh, euro system's uh, balance sheet. Now what are the effects? This is quite something, 1.5 trillion euros um, or towards the end of the year, dependent uh, whether the ECB will redesign a bit the program, nobody knows, uh, it is possible, not ex at least not excluded. So at the end of the year, about 2 trillion euros, and maybe they will go further, go, go beyond to the end of 2017 or to extend it uh, further. So it remains to be seen, but what, is, what are the effects on this? There are effects, yes. There is, I think nobody will deny and can deny that there are effects um, of, of this quantitative easing, of this massive, of this ultra loose monetary policy with negative interest rates or zero interest rates and this um, uh, wash of uh, liquidity. Nobody can and will deny that there are effects. But what are the effects? First, let me, uh, let me start with the question whether the measures are, quanti uh, are justified. You see here the ECB judgment, and this is my judgment. Um, uh, so there is some, uh, yeah. Uh, disagreement, yeah, uh, there is, but this is natural. So because the um, deflation of risk it ne has never existed. Uh, when I say it has never existed, um, it was exaggerated. And I made a point already in 2014 arguing what we see now at present in the, the 2000, end of 2013, beginning 2014, this is mainly driven by the collapse of oil prices, by the collapse of, um, um, uh, of um, uh, yeah, collapse of, of oil prices. And this works like a temp at least a temporary tax cut. So let's work this through. And this temporary tax cut will lead to a higher real disposable income for private households, will be translated into higher private consumption. And uh, this is what has happened. Uh, now this effect, effect is fading out with the uh, rising oil prices. Uh, but we had this effect. We had this effect, uh, and um, you can see the composition of uh, the contributors to GDP growth uh, in Germany, other countries, in the euro area as a whole. The main contributor to GDP growth over the last three years was private consumption, and mainly due to the uh, lower oil price uh, and uh, the higher real disposable income and higher private uh, consumption. So there was never the risk of bad deflation. Bad deflation. Uh, defined as a downwards, ongoing downward spir uh, spiral of prices, um, wages, a downward spiral in economic um, uh, activity, and with rising unemployment. We never had this were in this scenario, never ever, uh, since um, um, the, the, the start of quantitative easing. Never. What we have seen is, uh, let's say, good deflation. The main contributor to deflation, to this disinflationary process, was uh, was the um, collapse of um, uh, of the oil price. And another factor uh, has to taken into account, namely the adjustment process, the reform process in the peripheral in peripheral countries uh, in Europe, with the ongoing adjustment in relative prices. And this has also with negative interest, uh, ne negative um, uh, inflation rates in some countries. And this also has uh, contributed to the very low inflation rate. Now, too long a period of too low inflation, ECB judgment, yes. But why? We are in a situation, in a phase of, pri of price stability. And again, here, it comes, what comes into, into play is the changed definition of price stability by the ECB. 
The definition of price stability has not changed since 1998-1999. The definition of price stability of the ECB is to have an inflation rate of below 2%. Most people in the room will not know that. This has remained unchanged. What has changed in 2003 was to make it a bit more operational. Uh, in order to signal to financial markets, because this criticism came from the financial markets and from academics, yes, you are only prepared to fight inflation, but not to fight deflation. Uh, and for this reason, it, the definition of price stability remained unchanged. What has changed is to the aim, to aim at an inflation rate in the medium term of close but below 2%. There is a distinction here. So, an inflation rate of below 1% is price stability. In my view, in the current situation with, um, yeah, uh, with um, high, the highest degree of price trans transparency we, we, ever, we ever have had, with the um, innovations, uh, with the, um, with the purchase, online purchases and so on, we have full tri price transparency. The um, pricing power of companies um, has more or less disappeared. So we also have to take this into account and for me, a temporary negative inflation rate is not deflation. To be close to zero is not deflation. So I think uh, we have to rethink uh, this, uh, in particular the ECB has to rethink this. Also the inflation expectations in my view were not at risk. The, the credit uh, channel was hampered. Yes, I come to be, back to this uh, uh, in a moment. Here you see the inflation um, and uh, its components, and the, this is the energy part, the, the contribution of ener energy prices um, to the inflation rate. And you see the change in the course of um, 2013 when the contribution to inflation uh, of, the, of energy prices uh, um, turned negative, this one. What has un was it unchanged? As the prices, uh, the um, prices in the services sector, uh, a bit the change in the in the food sector. But um, you see that the main contributor to um, the negative to the uh, low interest rates was the, were, the, was were the energy prices. Surprisingly, we have now this jump in the inflation. Okay, still uh, in the in the um, in the field of price stability. Germany 1.7% in the euro area 1.1% in uh, in December. Mr. Draghi argues okay we have this is all driven by now he says it, this is all driven by the increase of the oil price. And we have to look through the oil price increase. Why did he not say this um, in this context to look through because it was all, or most of it, 84%, for instance, in the United States, 84% of, of the inflation was driven by the oil price uh, changes. Why did he not say, okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, European citizens, uh, we look through the situation, don't panic, no risk of deflation, uh, we will look through, this will take some time, maybe two or three years, but we have a medium-term objective, the medium-term objective is, and so on and so forth. So he did not do so. But now he says, okay, we have to um, look through. So postponing the adjustment, postponing the exit from negative interest rate policy and postponing the exit from... Uh, so I will not go through all these, uh, these issues here. As I said, there were some effects, the effect to some extent, also wealth effect, because the stock prices um, increased in, uh, in continental Europe as it did in the, in the United States. You see here residential property prices in the big cities. Uh, this is vis-a-vis -vis the national aggregate, so the national aggregates are already uh, uh, elevated, and this is on top. You see that there is an impact um, uh, on asset prices. So asset prices are up, and we have to some extent at least in some regions, asset price inflation. Um, government bond yields have come down um, significantly. So most recently, in the last uh, two uh, months, one and a half months in December, uh, again, mainly due to effects coming from, from the United States with the uh, economic policy regime shift that is uh, expected. Um, so yields went up again, uh, not only in the US, but also elsewhere. But before that, they were driven down significantly. Uh, and also the spreads were squeezed again, not reflecting the risks of some countries. Can you imagine that a country like Italy it was able to um, issue bonds with negative interest rates, You're getting a premium, getting a premium for higher indebtedness? Okay, we are in a very strange world. Um, corporate bond yields, yes, they went down, all this is fine. 
Uh, also, the lending rates for non-financial corporations, households, went down. Uh, credit went up. This is the yellow line here. But is all this justified um, with 1.5 trillion euros? And what is the impact on growth and inflation? This is extremely difficult to measure, what the impact of 1.5 trillion euros is on growth and inflation. But the ECB has an idea. The ECB has an idea. Mr. Draghi made this uh, public in, the, in his um, uh, press conference in December 8th uh, last year. The impact of past decisions, so the context of quantitative easing and uh, uh, negative interest rates, which account for, an, for a cumulative 1.3 percentage points growth over a three-year horizon and 1.5 percentage, percentage point inflation over a three years horizon. Congratulations, big success. The ECB has delivered higher growth and higher inflation. But what is behind these figures? Behind these figures are models. This is model-based. I have never trusted in models, not before the crisis, because they gave us wrong indications, and less so now. And I really don't trust these figures. And it's extremely difficult to single out the effect of monetary policy in the current circumstances. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible. So just to, to put a number, a figure to, to the public, say, OK, we were successful. And, what, and surprisingly, nobody questions these figures. There was no reaction in public on 1.3, 1.5. No reaction. But all this is model-based. What about inflation? And what is the real objective of the, the real target of the ECB? Mr. Draghi was asked again in December 8th by a journalist, 1.7% inflation in 2019, is that in line with below but close to 2%? And his answer was, not really. <laughs> In my judgment, the ECB has become the toughest inflation targeter of the world, trying to fine-tune the inflation rate. And going back to the, uh, to the chart with the inflation rate and its uh, components, the ECB has changed also his, its assessment. It's now focusing more and more on core inflation, because core inflation has remained stable at around 1%. So this is, um, I must say, not consistent, uh, no consistent policy, no consistent um, uh, argumentation. Now on the effectiveness. And here I refer to studies and the annual reports of the BIS, uh, Bank for International Settlement in Basel, and they were very clear already two or three years ago um, discussing quantitative easing before the ECB started uh, its quantitative easing, but discussing the quantitative easing, the effects of quantitative easing in the United States and the, in the United Kingdom. And now th there are five elements here. Deleveraging, set the uh, interest rate already at the zero lower bound, <coughs> risk premium already low, markets are inflexible, and the balance sheets of banks and, um, and uh, of corporates has not, um, uh, has not been repaired. If all these elements are in place, there is a risk that, that um, uh, monetary policy becomes ineffective. And then there are negative side effects, the so-called unintended consequences, they come into play. And this is exactly what we have in Europe. The leveraging is incomplete, so the debt overhang has, not, has, has been insufficiently reduced. We are at the zero lower bound. Risk premia are low. Markets, labor market, um, product market, services market are relatively inflexible. And the balance sheet of the banking system is not well advanced yet. And this is um, one element here, the NPLs, uh, non-performing loans. And you see in particular on the left hand of this chart countries with extremely high uh, <coughs> share of non-performing non loans uh, in percent of uh, the total loans. And the most famous case in Italy 
uh, here according to the ECB uh, and Commission, 20% uh, to, according to a different um, definition, it's only 16%, but the volume of non-performing loans in, Ilian, in Italy sum up to 360 billion euros. We have in the euro area as a whole more than 1 trillion euros non-performing loans, mainly concentrated here in, this, uh, in these countries. So, and this is a signal that with this heavy burden banks still have on their balance sheet, they are reluctant to provide credit, at least as an indicator. And negative interest rates have an impact on the bank's income. The blue part of these bars show the share of um, net interest income in bank's, income, bank's total income. And it goes up to 80%. Germany, you have here, with more than 60% of the bank's income is based on net, on the, on the interest margin. Also, in, for Belgium, you have a similar picture, where a similar uh, where is it? Here, it's more, it's uh, 65%. 65% of Belgium's bank's income is due to uh, interest income. And here, and this, com this comes from the ECB's Financial Stability Review 2016. So it's uh, not faked uh, from my side. Uh, and here you see the forecast for the main components of the net income 2016 and 2017 um, and changes since June 2015. And you see the net income showing down minus 8% in, in 2016 and minus 9.5% uh, in 2017. So against this background, with NPLs, with um, the um, negative impact on banks' income, banks' profitability, in other words, uh, taking also into account uh, the tightening in uh, regulation, uh, also the um, financial innovation, higher competition. So this brings banks uh, in, in Europe, in continental Europe, in a very, very difficult uh, situation, in particular in those countries which have done little or nothing at all in order to bring their banking system forward. And this is particularly the Itali in Italy the case. Now the unintended consequences. Um, uh, first point, the interest rate uh, has, has lost its steering and signaling function. This measures now with negative interest rates uh, risk to become counterproductive, um, there is a risk of cash hoarding, um, that um, uh, cash is um, hoarded and uh, not made available, not invested, not uh, uh, taken out of the, of the uh, circle, of the economic circle, uh, and this is, has a, a negative impact on the functioning of an economic market. I made just the point that the interest margins are squeezed, um, and uh, so this may lead to changes in the behavior, in the behavior of market participants, and in particular by banks, um, also to um, shift to cash or to restrain credit, to take less risk. And there is a negative income uh, effect. Now the unintended consequences um, in this combination, zero policy rates and wash of liquidity, this has distorting effects. Interest rates in the... Um, Corporate bond market, co interest rates in the government bond market do not signal any more the risk. So the risk premium has more or less disappeared. And what you have seen as spreads are more or less the, um, uh, the spreads, the time spreads. So all in all, um, the ECB is facing the risk creating or contributing to increasing financial instability uh, in the euro area and globally. And capital is being misallocated. They are sowing the seeds of new market exaggerations uh, and crisis. And moral hazard uh, has enhanced. Uh, Professor um, uh, Luca made this point early on. The incentive for governments uh, to do the right things, to, to go ahead with uh, structural reforms, uh, is not there. There is a disincentive, but no incentive anymore. I will not go into the details here. Um, um, the balance sheet adjustment has been postponed, which means that there are zombie banks and zombie companies, so the zombification of the euro area economy is a risk, like in Japan. So the, the Japanese model um, is also yeah, already vivid 
uh, in, the, in the euro area. Business models are uh, destroyed, in, for instance, in the insurance, uh, in the life insurance uh, companies. Uh, we have redistribution effects. Um, we have disincentives for intermarket activity. We have, again now, banks that still rely on the ECB's um, operations, liquidity operations, um, because other banks are in mistrust to those banks. So the interbank market doesn't work, it doesn't really work in all countries. It works in most countries, but not in all. In all. And we have the international spillovers. I made this point already earlier uh, in, the, in Sweden, in, uh, in, in Denmark, but also in emer emerging markets. And sovereigns underlying fiscal imbalances are masked. And this is shown here, uh, taken from uh, Standard & Poor's uh, analysis um, uh, conducted in 2016. The change in government, general government balance 2015, assuming normal interest rates, and the normal effective interest rates are assumed to be identical to the rates uh, each sovereign experienced um, on average during the 2001 to 2008 period. And you see that um, under assumption of normal interest rate, the average 2001 to 2008, Belgium and other countries would have 2% or more higher fiscal deficits. Also Germany, no black zero anymore, no surplus anymore, but the deficit, 1.6%. And um, so with the change, with the exit of the ECB from, from the current situation, from the current, current policies, with, with this will have a major impact on uh, also on the on sovereigns. Now, exit or monetary policy normalization. Will there be a new normal or renormal? The American economist John Taylor made this point: renormalization versus new normal. New normalization. I think we will have a new normal. We cannot go back and will not go back to the old, to the situation we had before 2008. But given now the multiple and um, complex central banks' objectives, for instance, by the, at the ECB with being responsible for banking supervision, being in charge of financial stability, with this combination of tasks, with this combination of, uh, uh, of objectives and instruments, it is very likely that the exit will be very, very complex uh, and uh, not very smooth. And with monetary policy normalization, we will see asset prices, excessive leverage, and the underpricing of credit risk be abruptly corrected. And then we are on the, on the verge of a, of a new uh, crisis. Very briefly, to sum up, 2008-2009, uh, I think central banks around the world, in particular in the Western world, were successful in uh, preventing the meltdown of the global financial system and uh, also severe economic uh, depression. The ECB since 2010 has bought time, but this time has not been used um, uh, wisely. Uh, it has discouraged governments uh, to take bold action and to tr address their real economic uh, weaknesses. Monetary has, has clear limits. Already today, monetary policy is uh, overburdened. In my view, QE is in the euro area unjustified. The measures are based on a wrong diagnosis. We never had a risk of deflation, uh, to be very clear on this. And uh, the risk of becoming less effective after a balance sheet recession and when rates are already at the zero lower bound are there. Now, such a policy, such an ultra-loose policy for Tulung, has uh, distorting effects, and the costs will become apparent only over time. And with monetary policy normalization, asset prices over or stretched, overstretched asset prices the leverage, the underpricing of risk could be abruptly corrected. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>